remembering Kirstie Alley and how. Yes, today, number 286 of Trekland Tuesdays, live with me, Dr. Trek Larry Nemechek, coming at you here from the heart of Trekland for some sanity, clarity, and the big picture in everything Star Trek. So glad you could join us again on another Tuesday. Lots of things to get to today. One of those weeks where I wasn't sure what we'd be talking about, and then the sad news last night, early in the evening here, Pacific time, that Kirstie Alley had apparently been fighting a recent diagnosis of cancer and uh, did not win her fight. So look, um, if you are with us, if you're new to Tuesdays Live, jump in the chat here, introduce yourself, let us know where you're from. I'll get to the chat in a moment. I wanna talk about both Kirsty and Savick and our memories and maybe a couple of stories. Again, once again, shining a light on the times we live in just a little bit. Uh, but it is a great week. It's a busy week. So glad you're with us. Uh, all our veterans are going to be here. And maybe you're a newbie. If you are, you, you can, you're free to lurk. But I hope you'll pop up and at least let us know you're out there and where you're coming from. Because this is a crazy busy week. There's a lot going on. Let me just say right off the top of the bat, if you have not registered in for your free and virtual seat for our seventh anniversary open house for Portal 47. It's the one time a year we open the doors, the portal, let everybody in, have a, we always have special guests because they're all shining a light on the backstage of Star Trek. But I save some of the biggest, some of the biggest folks for the open house every year. Uh, it is Wednesday, December 7th. We start at 6 p.m., with, again, it's a taste of what Portal 47 is. So we start with an Ask Dr. Trek roundtable, only this one has door prizes. And that's why we need you to register over at LarryNemechek.com. And then at 7 o'clock, I'll be joined by, yes, Iris Stephen Bear, the executive producer and showrunner of, of DS9. And, of course, par of the course, I'm going to be looking at not the same old, same old. Because there's been so much about DS9 books, documentaries even, at the same time, I'm not going to shirk on DS9, but I think there's some nooks and crannies of Ira's Trek life that we can get into both before and after DS9. I hope you can join us. Look, it's virtual. It is global. It's worldwide. It's free. Our roundtable at six with it's basically open mic. And I'll, I'll want to hear from everybody who's there, especially folks who are new to Trekland, who are new to our community here. I'm so excited for this. Go to LarryNemechek.com. The links are there. Follow them. Just leave your name and email so we can do the drawing for the prizes. And we'll get to that. Prizes like, hey, a season two Blu-ray of Picard, uh, I, the copy of First Contact new coffee table book that I showed last week, we unboxed. How about a season two DVD of Lower Decks? Blu-ray actually. And not one, but two copies of the brand new Discovery Season 4. So thank you to CBS and Paramount for, for all of those. And um, thanks to Penguin Random House for our book copy. Anyway, it's always a fun night. This is the seventh anniversary of Portal, which is there all year round. It's, uh, I've been trying to pioneer this. feels like the rest of the world caught up a little bit to what we started in 2015, which is using the virtual space live to talk to the folks backstage at Star Trek and to have great community. And I've got, I know we've got a lot of Portales on here. I hope everybody can join us tomorrow night live, no matter where you are. That's exciting. Other things are happening, of course, around Trekland too. But um, no, it really was interesting. We were, I've been on a real, I don't know about you, but I do other things besides watch Star Trek. Um, and not even watch my Sooners, <laughs> what a year and uh, docent out at Will Rogers State Historic Park for my guy, Will. We have been, we binged watched, slow motion binged watched Foil's War. I think I've mentioned that on a couple of places and then got into not Inspector Morse, but went with the young, his younger version prequel, Endeavor. And now we're going through Endeavor and I've gotten sucked into it. So I was watching Endeavor last night when I looked down and got the word from my good friend, Neil Halford was the, that's how I found out because, um, well, we had a personal stake in this. First had the word that uh, Kirstie Alley had passed away, apparently of cancer, apparently of a recent diagnosis. Sadly, her, her two children with Parker Stevenson uh, released the word on Monday. Uh, True and Lily Parker, very sweet on her 
Twitter account. Very, you know, as you would expect in that kind of a situation. Thanked their doctors. Talked about her life and zest. And yes, her children and grandchildren. So she had a blessed life that way. And of course, all the news stories. I'm sitting here looking at the Variety story. Everybody talks cheers, obviously. And look who's talking. And she even had, you know, Veronica's Closet and some of her later sitcoms. And her, her weight loss <laughs> championing. But of course, this is Trekland. And when we say Kirstie Alley, we think of, of course, Savick. We think of Star Trek II, the Wrath of Khan. We think of the original Savick. And we think of uh, what a... <laughs> is, it, is it soft putting to say what an impact that movie and her character had on us, even though obviously it was recast for the third one. We want to blame it on the manager that asked too much money. What do we want to blame it on cheap Paramount for not asking too much? I mean, you can see what Harv says. You can still hear what Nick Meyer has to say about that. Of course he was directing and was not totally, totally the only voice in the room about that. There were the budget guns at Paramount. And a lot of question marks remember going into Star Trek two. Uh, very famously, just trying to get, you know, f the motion picture had run over a budget. Most of it not Gene's fault. A lot of it was the accounting folks at Paramount trying to accountant, trying to bookkeep their losses all through the 70s. It's amazing how this shit never goes away. It just sits around in piles in the corners. But all the stories and legends and sagas of not one, not two, but three restart attempts to bring back Star Trek once the dollar signs overtook the question marks in the eyes of a studio uh, leadership. But all that stuff got piled on the books for Star Trek motion picture. Gene was out. He's executive consultant. People thought that would be the end of him. Ha ha. But that's what the coloration was as Star Trek II happened. And then going into three, when budgets were still seen to be about the same and the fateful decision was made Yada yada. I mean, it's a problematic world. Look, par, uh, Judson Scott agent was ridiculous and didn't get him even billing at all in the movie upfront billing. He has a credit, but he doesn't have billing and missed out on all of that. He was a face at the time, but I, you know, the Phoenix, his series. So, you know, blunders like that happen. And, and it's amazing to think now about how those kinds of decisions and things are made and, and, you know, so that's what set up for an hour, for a couple of years there, for a storied couple of years, Kirsty's role was Savick. And it was her breakout role. It was what brought it, I mean, she'd been working out there. Obviously, Savick is what put her on the map for casting agents. And maybe even that agent's decision was a little bit of snobbery. Maybe there was still a little bit of, you know, pre-geek revolution 80s. I have a breakout talent here. And rather than see the potential of a franchise, he didn't want her to get stereotyped and pigeonholed. And so, no, we're just going to ask for a lot. And if they pay it, then we'll laugh all the way at the bank. And if they don't pay it, well, we're going to go out. She's made such an impact. She's so striking. We're going to run to whatever else we can. And obviously it happened. She replaced Shelley Long. She didn't replace her. She was a totally different character. But that slot in the show on Cheers is what, launched her yeah she had the movie career with luke look who's talking and travolta you know and then she's off and running with a career and then after that she's doing the sitcom she's working the variety show we, we think about this but she really did always work all the way through it's amazing how people have been reacting on twitter some of the folks that worked with her obviously and i i know robin curtis love her to pieces it's one of those things it's almost like the two darren's and samantha you know it's like <laughs> It's it's like Roseanne. It's like it's something with every show when someone is replaced, although this was a movie. So you don't have 2652 hike. You don't have all those episodes of one character and then all those episodes with the other actor in that character. Here we've got two hours, two hours, 20 minutes, basically. So love Robin to death, but there's just a certain impetus to you remember your first fondly and i think that's where a lot of people and a lot of people will say they prefer robin's savic and a lot of people 
were charmed by Kirsty and Savick, but they didn't ever quite see that being a Romulan. And yes, I know the backstory was supposed to be, she was supposed to be a Vulcan Romulan hybrid. That was the original intention. That's what they cast. That's what they filmed with. That's what she cries at the funeral. That's why she does some not quite emotional as, as emotional as, as Spock would be even in the eighties. And um, that's why that was all retconned out. And by the time of the Star Trek three, script robin could famously talk about all leonard could tell her to do was be drier be drier be drier and the fans are left wondering what happened well that's the real world book maybe you say savick was a little bit of a shock after her ordeal and that's just her emotion we have shouty spock early we can have smiley savick we can have flirty savick before she Straightened up and fly right. And then, of course, the the by the time of 1992 and Kirsty's career is sky high, Nick wanting her to come back and be Savick for Star Trek VI, they didn't even consider Robin, rightly or wrongly. That's Hollywood, folks. And Kirsty and her agent saying, we don't want to go backwards 10 years. You know, that they, looking at that as a sign of going backwards, not realizing what pop culture and the attitudes that actors and agents and writers and directors for that matter, the attitude they have about cinematic universes. Now <laughs> all those Marvel actors do their Marvel bit and then they go off and they, they make little movies. They go off and make knives out. That was all before she didn't come back to be Savick again. Savick, you know, turned into Kim Cattrall's totally putting the stamp on a completely different character. Gene Roddenberry in his dying months, not it, or Gene or Leonard or Richard Arnold, not wanting Savick's character to, to be a betrayal anyway. So uh, the way Valkyrie turned out to be. So that is what that is. But that was a factor in the recipe of Six, reaching out to her and being turned down and then not going with Robin, not even going with Savick and having this. That's, that's part of the lore of Star Trek Six. But it's part of also Kirsty's life. And again, it's the 80s and the 90s. And our movie series was all about people who had played a character already. And the movies were the icing on the cake. Whether you're talking about the original series cast or the next gen cast. And any people that were their guest stars were either folks who were on their way up in these movies or actors who had... Dame Judith Anderson, anyone? <laughs> Actors who had made it and had no, they had no ego to bruise. They had nothing to fear. It was either a great gotcha moment or it was, uh, you know, uh, it was just a, it was another plum. It was another cherry on top of their career. They had nothing to fear by being typecast in a big budget role. They weren't in that pivot jump off time. So that's really the state of the Star Trek movies then that's not been the case with the Kelvins under the JJ era. And that's one thing you can say if you think about who's been the, the lead guest stars in those movies. But um, that was the world that Kirsty faced. But it's also a sign of where her career was then. And then, you know, the world moved on and there was no need for Savix. I don't know had that's a question has lord dex even uh approached had they thought about even having a savic one way or the other did they not want to choose between robin and kirsty i i don't know something tells me that mike would have found a way to go meta and make a joke out of the whole two casting <laughs> the way we do with everything on lord dex it's safe to say though that after her two years as savic whether it was her own instinct or her agent's instinct her management, whoever was running her life that way, not to be involved with Star Trek, famously. After her years of excitement and being there, um, she was steered away from Star Trek. Not even, as we know now, you know, convention appearances. It took a lifetime to go by. What, 45 years? 44 years? It took all that time to run by before she made, and of course, it was the 2016 Vegas convention, the 50th anniversary, 5-0 fever. And among those caught up in it were, uh, were Whoopi, and, uh, who had never had a Star Trek convention appearance, and 
Kirsty. Now, that was not Kirsty's first time. Famously, as I did in my posts, uh, Kirsty got swept up in the net and was at the Ultimate Fantasy two weeks after it opened in, in uh, the Ultimate Fantasy in Houston, two weeks after Star Trek II opened nationally, obviously. She and Merritt Buttrick both, and Har Bennett down there, not Gene, but Har Bennett. So all the saga and the Sturm and Drang, and yes, when we get the documentary finished, um, that whole saga will be part of that. Now look, Kirsty was 31 or so, born in 51, this is, this is 82. She's 30, 31-ish when the movie's filming and when it's opening and her career has broken wide open and she's she's enjoying every second of that. She not only was at Ultimate Fantasy though, slash Houston Con 82, there was a Bay Area convention she was at. Laura Banks has told me about being buds with Kirsty. I'm sure it'll be in Laura's upcoming book uh, about her Star Trek interactions and her life in Hollywood and, and uh, talk about life on the <laughs> life on the name a letter list. That'll be a good read too. A lot of good books coming up this way. Some insider, not so much insider tell all, but just insight. Oh my gosh, this is amazing books. And like Andrea Kindred's, Andy Richardson, Andrea Kindred's book, Code Switch, and her Star Trek years. No, Kirsty really enjoyed those couple of years. She did one or two or three cons. And if you were lucky enough to be at one of those conventions, you, like me, could have her autograph on a Star Trek picture from back in the day. There was no merchandise. I have a black and white cast picture. I should have got it. Cast picture with her autograph. I have the picture at the moment she signed it in the line with Merritt and with Laura and, <laughs> and with Carrie O'Quinn from Starlog. The underlings. The other insight I have on Kirsty, because the, the bottom line is we never got an interview together. For the, This is one of my regrets. This is why my friend Neil, who was my DP, was the one who sent me the signal, got me the word. I had talked to Kirsty's manager at that convention backstage about sitting down to do it. And it was a little bit funny because I said, I'd love to get her. We've got everybody else in the cast, including Hard Bennett, who had passed by then. And he said, hmm. and I bet nobody took any money for, for, for it. I said, no. He said, okay. Well, we were waiting to get further along to see what we had before we came back to her. So one of my regrets here is I never sat down and did the interview with her. Now, my good friend, Dan Madsen, who's been our guest the past two weeks on Trek Files, the same way I love to look at a few people in Star Trek, like, like Nicole DeBoer, the first interview they did as in Star Trek uh, was with me there. The first interview Kirsty ever did for Star Trek was with Dan for the then Star Trek II movie fan club newsletter. And we're searching for that right now. I know we re reprinted it in our 150th issue. But uh, Dan was the first one to interview Kirsty in those heady days. And it may have even been on the lot. I have to get the story. Actually, it's in these last two editions of the Trek Files episodes, uh, the one that just came out today. And, uh, and last week as well, that's one of the stories that pops up. So you want to catch that, of course. Uh, no, here's a, here's the thing. One of the earliest thoughts I had about Kirsty, insights into her I had, was in the day. Never met her face to face. I never met her, I'm sure I, well, I met her in autograph line in 82 in Houston. But <clears throat> the insight I have of her is when I was in grad school, at the University of Kansas for two years. And the first year was the fall of 82, which is why I'm an extra for five seconds in one frame of the day after, which Nick Meyer turned to after he wrapped up the Wrath of Khan. Can you imagine going from the Wrath of Khan to the day after the apocalyptic end of the world? I mean, there's lots out there. It's available now. Talk about a cultural landmark, <clears throat> both for the world and for the people of Lawrence, Kansas. University of Kansas hometown, which is where it was filmed. And not that Kirsty had anything to do with the day after, <clears throat> but that was very much in the air that fall. And it just so happens that one of the, my fellow grad students was a high school speech and theater teacher from Wichita. His name was Tom. And in one of the sit around the green room lounge bits between classes, and I was figuring out what the hell I was trying to do with my life, I'm going to go teach. Uh, get a doctorate and teach college. The subject came up because the Wrath of Khan had just come out that summer. 
And sitting around, it turned out that uh, he knew Kirsty. He had had her in class in high school as a teacher. And he was talking about how her dad owned lumber yards, was a big lumber yard home center owner around Wichita. And how there had been, you know, there were conventions around Wichita. And how he had a memory of her both as a student and and we he was enough of a he was a theater nerd for one thing. You know, he was one step into fandom even in the early 80s, even as a man in his, I don't know, 40s. <clears throat> he was coming back to get his master's to up his you know teaching potential, pay potential. But he talked about remembering Kirsty as a kid, as a teenage girl, and what a huge Trek fan she was. He says, oh, I remember her running around conventions with her pointed ears on. I mean, the stereotypical image <laughs> of a Trek fan there in Wichita, Kansas. <clears throat> and talking about how he knew how thrilled and excited she was. And maybe he'd even heard it trickle back through the local grapevine. Wichita's not a small town, but still, if you know where to go hang out in those lumber yards, you might have picked up on it. But the stories you hear from Leonard Nimoy and Nick Meyer about her nailing her audition and blowing them away. She had practiced. She didn't just practice her Vulcan eyebrow raise to audition. She had done it as a kid. We now know it was such a shock. Kirsty was really the first, the first generation of fan to get professionally into Trek. She was ahead of, the Michael Dorns and ahead of, you know, Star Trek had to be around long enough to raise a generation to become actors, writers, directors, creatives, artists, etc., visual effects, all the way down the line. All the folks we know who were secret fanboys and fangirls who got the keys to the car, to the Star Trek car, and had done, you know, from Ron Moore all the way to Mike McMahon, Terry Metalis, and many in between. Uh, Aaron Walkie. Um, Begumman Brothers, all of that. Kirsty was really like kind of the first one of that young crop to come into it and show us the power of that. Yeah, she didn't rehearse her Vulcan eyebrow raise for audition. She did it already because she was a kid. She was a fan. So I always, I will always thank Tom for that little moment of insight because it colored everything else, including the soap opera about not having her recast in three. What a what a journey for a kid from Kansas to wind up in LA and that heart, you know, and the world of the 80s and know that your heart, your hardcore moment, something you loved as a kid and you got to do right off the bat and it makes you famous. Then you're almost like pulled away from it. I'm sure advised against it. And then maybe you that then maybe you're happy with it or you're not happy with it, but you go along with it because you're young and you're starting your career and you're doing what the experts are telling you. Just like we hear from writers and uh, Virginia Madsen, her agent said she was crazy for doing that Voyager episode. What are you doing? You're a movie star. Why are you doing this? She says, because it's Star Trek and I want to do it. Uh, you know why you hear that story occasionally over and over again especially for the TV. It's, the, the movies are one thing. The TV series, my God, are another for careers. And again, all in the era before we had cinematic TV, streaming, big cinema, the walls are coming down. All the boxes are coming. We are in a new era, but let's go back to the 80s and 90s. And I, that strikes me. It also is what I bear in mind in all the years as social media raged and Kirsty went very right wing and upset a lot of people and supported Trump supported a lot of not just Republican, but right-wing causes. And it, it, it disappointed a lot of people, people who still had memories of having their crush on Kirstie and Savick back in the day. And a lot of people were upset by that. They were disappointed. I mean, she's entitled to have her opinion, but she and a lot of other people are all sucked up on both sides, are sucked up into what social media has amplified things we might not have ever known otherwise, and people feel compelled to share, Facebook or Twitter. So no, I wasn't happy. 
I was pulling for her though to 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 for her health all the years she was in and out of the weight loss program since she had her own company for a while that was you know all of that we watch our favorites age <laughs> we're all aging but we watch our favorites like that age and sometimes we don't always get to write the script that we would have liked to write for them but i will say the last i i'm hoping this is a global phenomenon i know it's not but I'd like to think that somewhere there's hope. You will notice if you go back and look at her Twitter feed the last year or two or three, she had decidedly, decidedly cooled off on her political app. She had totally got back into happiness and positivity and cute kittens and grandkids and pets and, uh, you know, for a, a long ways back. A lot of the acidity of her, say, Twitter feed uh, had evaporated. And whether that was totally conscious decision for persona or that was um, just her own life mellowing out. She's not on the treadmill of having to be perfect and worry about her appearance and worrying about her career moves. And I mean, she's got grandkids for God's sake. She's a grandma. <laughs> and the fact that it was only six years ago, that's what I say when you sit back and you look at the paths that actors and other celebrities and public folks have, take. Uh, I remember there was a time there right after Next Generation when Sir Patrick, Patrick Stewart, was uh, not thrilled to be totally linked in. He was, you know, it's a dance you do with yourself. How much do I want to do of this or not? You see it to some extent with a lot of actors and actresses. And eventually, when the years go by, it just takes some time to have the, to have the big picture, to have the perspective that you go, I need to do a lot of things with my life and I have done them, but it's, it's folly to run away with the thing that I may be the most famous for after what's going to be on my tombstone long after I'm dead and gone. Well, in Kirsty's case is apparently is going to be cheers and it's apparently going to be, uh, you know, Veronica's claws. Oh, it, it, look who's talking. I mean, she did win an Emmy for cheers, a lot of nominations. Uh, so I guess, on a legit resume scale, that's what you would do. But the passing of Kirsty, Kirsty Louise Alley, and the fact, oh, she was an interior designer. And yeah, she, whatever you think of Scientology, she was involved with Scientology and and had had fought a cocaine addiction. It was the 80s when she got popular. I mean, you know, her and had been sober. Um you can read about her biography everywhere, read what other people are saying and some of her, a lot of her colleagues. It's mostly been the positive. And some folks, yes, remember her politically rightward words and, and the, the disappointed people or the angry people. And maybe the people that only know her from Cheers and her movie and they didn't ground themselves with her as Kirsty. And I'm not saying that's, that's a panacea, that's a blank check. But I'm just saying, aside the fact that when someone dies, you'd like to think well of them. And aside from the fact that I think she had tempered a lot of her, oh, not her extremism. I don't think she was an extremist. I think she was just on the snarkier pointed end of things, blunt, much like her character on Cheers. But uh, it looks like she had uh, mellowed that, softened that a lot in the last few years. Especially she had softened to the point where she felt comfortable enough about coming and celebrating her Star Trek time and looking at the fandom that whether by advice or by instinct herself, and I'm going to say, I cannot believe that little girl who ran around with Spock ears and practiced her eyebrow years ahead of needing it for a role in her breakout career. I want to say that little girl, that little Trekkie in her teen years, I have to say that not doing Star Trek for thinking she couldn't and living in the celebrity media world of the 80s and 90s, I'm going to say that coming full circle to where she felt comfortable in her skin, I'm going to say I think she always felt comfortable in her skin. It was always worrying about what was good for her career to the point where you get to 2016, six years ago, she was 65, where she said, F it, who cares? I'm going to do this. Now, I hope she got well paid. I'm sure lots of folks, including uh, Derek, her manager, were um, – we're on to about do it. Look, it's time. If any time is right, why not the 50th? Which was happening for a lot of folks. Again, it was Whoopi's first convention, I believe. I'm pretty sure. 
aside from any you know promo she did. I don't think she did promo for generations, movie movie level promo. So, and a lot of lot of lot of Star Trek fandom, old and new, veteran and newbies. Everybody was on the same page, unless you were there at the Bay Area or in Houston in '82. Nobody had ever had the chance to see here catcher. At a, at a fan convention, much less a Trek convention, and much less the biggest one in the, in the world. I'd like to think that that was some closure. Not to get morbid, oh, I'm going to be gone in six years, so I'm glad I did this. I just think that was... Um, and It's not that she still embraced it. Again, she had a family. And on the sum of things, it looms large in our mind, but in her world, look at her resume. It was one feature movie, and that's her connection to Star Trek. On the, tele on the, on the ledger sheet... In the great tally of movie credits in IMDb world, it was one movie, one big non-mistake <laughs> that she didn't wind up going on with it in terms of the times. But it was great that she had that closure, that she had that full circle for her and for the fandom. That was right as her toxicity was about to take off as far as social media goes. So I'm glad that that happened then because if it had waited until the last year or two, maybe not so much. But then again, this onset cancer seems to have been not just diagnosed, but come on rapidly. She chose to live it out quietly with her and the family. And now we have the, the news. And that's what I'm going to say about that. That's today's uh, theme talk, gang. In a week that's so much, in a week and a month, and holidays are heating up, I know, uh, in a week that's going on some, with so much happening. But again, you should grab your chance to get your ticket free it's virtual but you want to be there for the drawings get there at six o'clock pacific nine eastern and yeah i know that's three four in the morning for all of our european friends um with ira round table first drawings and then ira at seven it's our seventh anniversary open house for portal 47 i can't believe we've been seven now going into our eighth year with portal um for all the Star Trek fans who have no idea how much Star Trek they still have no idea about. Thanks to all the backstage folks and creatives that we pull in and and uh, my archives and, yeah, our great, great community of portales that we've got going. And it's the one time we open it up for everybody. So once a year, come on with an awesome guest. Also to say, while you're on my page, learningimagecheck.com, to find your click in to save your free ticket and get the info back about where to go. Uh, and don't forget, submitting questions in advance so you avoid the during-the-show rush, okay? Just a reminder that next July, for 10 days, Los Angeles and San Francisco, Terrace at Geek Nation Tours and I are having first time in six years, speaking of 2016, the, the West Coast Away mission, which will have more celebrities involved. That's just four of them. We're, we're going to have some more coming up. Uh, that's in July, and then also if you're in town for the cruise or not, before or after, we've got a one-day special Trekline Treks. I call it the LA Away Days, four of the biggest sites we can go to in a day. If you're in town, be on the cruise, and you spent some extra days to putter around LA because you're from the rest of the country, and the cruise is leaving from LA this year. So check that out. It's all there on my homepage. You can head off to the links. Uh, so much happening. But as always, I want to thank our Patreons again, our TTL Club, Diana Hopkins, Lawrence Todd, Keith Rombach, Nathaniel Robinson, Robin Wilson, and marie Siegel, Justin Porteous, Andrew Dzimski, Pranakasha Productions, Gay Levin, Gay <laughs> Cleveland Lundstrom, and Glenda Bruton. And yes, our live wires, Hubbard Gunn Johnson, Robert McLean, Alan Hewensi, J.R. Poole, Byron Bailey, Dave Gregory, and Casey Shafsky. We just started a new month, but uh, Patreon is a way to support creatives, project by project or month to month even. If you want to help me, five, ten bucks, simple. It's easy. Patreon.com slash Trekland Live is where to find me. You might find somebody else you want to help and support. I do appreciate it. We're about to make another step forward as it's been in the <laughs> – we keep debating exactly how this is going to look, but uh, some add-ons are coming don't want to blow it up too big, but uh, we'll, we're going to evolve a little bit in the new year. And I want to thank all of our patrons for helping that and welcome anybody else aboard. Just like I welcome you to check out this week's Trek Files from Roddenberry Podcasts. Uh, I mentioned earlier Dan Madsen's back with us looking at the early days of not just 
what became the official club magazine and and communicator magazine uh rip as of 2005. um but um and me getting to edit it for the last seven years before we went into license weirdness and buyouts and all of that but also just the relationship between studio and um the media star trek and the media and especially the official studio born media and the constraints we had to deal with when the independents who weren't official got to run scat free and the one time he uh blanked that <laughs> he beat beat the game when he was first to add it yeah the trek files uh podcast.roddenberry.com for all the great roddenberry podcasts speaking of which i want to do a shout out to mission log john and norm last night thank you for mentioning the open house this week also t rick jones at daily star trek news did us a very nice story this week if you're on their newsletter and getting their daily uh deep dive uh narrow dive whatever you've got time for in the day thanks to a lot of the folks who have been helping get the word out thanks to uh ryan and melissa and Anne marie and everybody at uh, well i say the seventh rule but uh, star trek and chill friday night had me on and i got to mention open house too so trying to get the word out there uh, if you know anybody, please send them over. You see the social media flying by. Please direct them over. We can take people up until I, I probably won't have to fix up the drawing machinery. But I'm going to, you know, up until three and four in the afternoon Pacific. It's easy to get over and get filled in. I'll be, I'll be checking to see who the late arrivals are. I have to cut it off at some point. But uh, be excited for that. It's one Now, look, it's one chance per person. So entering five times for your seat since it's virtual, you know, I know you're not buying five seats since you're at home, but it's not five chances at the drawings, but uh, hopefully, we, you know, hopefully we'll have a lot of folks. We'll have enough uh, giveaways before and after Ira. We'll have a little after show after Ira leaves us, unless Ira just hangs on and gives us two hours like Mac McMahon did last year. That was insane. Again, you don't want to miss it. And you don't want to miss me anywhere if you can. It's Larry Nemechek on uh, Twitter and now Mastodon. I'm getting in over there. Larry Nemechek's Trekland on YouTube, as you know. Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Same thing for Instagram and, of course, good old Facebook. Uh, Portal47.net is where you can read about Portal 47. That's what the open house is all about. Let the world see how it works and share it once a year. Appreciate you going over and doing that. And, you know... If you're watching us later on YouTube, you missed all this live liness. Please leave a comment below, though. Even so, it's not live. Um, these things will be around for a while. <laughs> and uh, maybe you can join us live sometime. Meanwhile, after all that, I'm just going to say, everybody, stay healthy, please. We, we're, we don't want a, a, a tripdemic. Is that what I'm hearing? Take care of yourselves out there. Get the shots you need from whether it's COVID or the flu or whatever. It's going to be a rough year after two years of everybody masking. We're seeing numbers go up. So, and the flu is not fun, even though it's just the flu. Uh, it still takes you out of things, and you don't want to. You don't want to miss the holiday times. We want you to be safe and have a great 2023. So please do all the things. And while you're at it, you know I say stay woke. What I mean is check your sources. Keep your eyes open to new ideas, just make sure the ideas are legit. <laughs> and Trekwell.